Assalamu alaikum, peace be with you and welcome to Islam and Life with me, Tariq Ramadan, broadcasting from London. In today's show, we ask the question, what is happening to the Muslims of Myanmar and why? According to recent reports, Muslims in Myanmar are suffering a tragic plight. Reports show that of nearly one million Muslims, several hundred have been killed since 28th of June during clashes in the western region of Rakhine. The UN has described Myanmar Muslims as one of the most persecuted minorities in the world. They are deprived of basic rights including education and employment and are subject to forced labour, extortion and other coercive measures. The government of Myanmar refuses to recognise the Muslim minority. Human Rights Watch organization reported earlier in July that Burmese security forces have been implicated in killings and other abuses since the sectarian violence in northern Arakan state began. This is while the United States and the European Union are largely silent about the human rights violations and the massacres targeting Muslims in Myanmar. Nobel Peace Prize laureate Aung San Suu Kyi, who is deeply admired by the United States and the British government, is criticised because of her silence over the plight of Muslims. The head of the Organisation of Islamic Corporation urged Myanmar's pro-democracy Aung San Suu Kyi to help end violence against the Muslim community in her country. This week's Islam and Life asks, what is happening to the Muslims of Myanmar and why? This is an important question. It's as if when it comes to what is happening there in Myanmar, the world is silent. We don't know exactly what is happening. Some are talking about uh, something which has to do with immigrants, has nothing to do with religion. Some are trying to avoid the discussion. And even coming from Muslim majority countries, it's quite silent. We don't hear so much about what is happening there. These are interesting. This is interesting. Why? Because it's a very important region and for the last uh, decade and even before this, the Muslims have been facing discriminations and violence. And not only this, discrimination on the job market, uh, even uh, expulsion and, and rejection from within the society, not considered as truly citizens in the country. And this is uh, uh, not covered, no word. And as it was said in the clip, even Aung San Suu Kyi is not talking about it. She is very, very uh, clear on anything which has to do with human rights. When it comes to this rejection, there is uh, uh, quite a consensus within the political uh, uh, landscape and through all the political uh, parties that this is not a discussion to have, it's not a, a, a case to support. So we are coming to this discussion now and we have some questions to ask about what is happening, why and what could be the way forward. And to answer all these questions, I'm joined by Mabrur Ahmad, co-director and co-founder of Restless Beings, a grassroots charitable organization working on human rights issues. Thank you so much for being with us. As we were uh, saying in the clip and in the introduction, it's as if we don't know what is happening and there is a silence. Yeah. Why this silence? So before on trying to understand why this silence in, in the international community, let us try to understand the history. Okay. Uh, how many Muslims are living there? What is, uh, uh, how could we explain their presence in this society and uh, the minority realities and, and what they are facing on the ground? Sure. It's a really loaded question, so I'm going to go back yes. a couple of steps. And I think, as you, as you mentioned, we have to go back in history to find some of the answers for what's happening now. Um, so Burma, which is now called Myanmar, um, has, you know, it was actually a British colony um, up until you know, the, the early 40s, Second World War, etc. Um, and then it underwent its own kind of independent democratic state. And it enjoyed quite a lot of success under, under that democratic state until 1962. Um, which is when uh, a general by the name of Ni Win came into power um, in Burma. 
and when he came into power, uh, he wanted to push a very kind of, if you like, one identity, um, one Burmese ethnicity with one religion, Buddhism. Now, Burma has always been a country made up of many different nationalities, ethnicities, and uh, you know def different mi minority groups. Um, and at that particular time in 1962, prior to that, the Rohingya, um, who and, and, and it's important to understand that it's we're not talking about Muslims, all Muslims in Burma. We're talking about a particular ethnicity of mus Muslims called the Rohingya. So the Rohingya, up until that stage, had in enjoyed freedom as everyone else. Um, but in 1962, there was a crackdown on the number of accepted ethnic minorities. And it came down from roughly around about 150 down to 135 ethnic minorities of the country. Now, the Rohingya were not recognized as one of those minorities. Mm -hmm. um, and through the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, and early 2000s, there was this building pressure um, towards uh, the Rohingya. And I'll, I'll come back to that uh, in, a little, uh, in a little while. But the question that you initially asked was, why do we not know about this? I mean, that's, it's such a startling thing, you know, especially mm. in light of what's been happening recently. And the main reason is since 1962, it's been a military dictatorship. And as such, the press has been very, very restricted. You know, hardly, it's, it's, it's one of those unknown countries of the world, um, you know, on the sort of similar parallel as a country like, for example, North Korea or mm. Vietnam before, before the uh, US invasion mm -hmm. there. It's that type. Because, that, because, yeah. because of the dictatorship, because it was of the difficult dictatorship. to know what was happening. Absolutely. And very often we were talking about, you know, some of the key figures like mm. uh, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi yeah. uh, acting against the, 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 yeah. the military. But I have one question, uh -huh. because when I was talking about about this and, 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 and talking about, uh, you know, this uh, discrimination towards the Muslims. Uh, I got an answer by people who knew the situation mm -hmm. that saying exactly what you were saying, yeah. saying this is we are talking about the Rohingya, it, we are talking about a very specific ethnic minority mm -hmm. uh, who happened for the people to That's be right. Muslims. That's so right. it's not against Islam, it's not against Muslims. Absolutely. They are Muslims mm -hmm. and there are other Muslims within the society who are very well uh, accepted. Even, I was told, is even uh, uh, worse than this, that some of the Muslims from the majority society are not very happy with the Muslims of, from Absolutely. Rohingya. So, so it's quite... Uh, I'm, I'm so glad you confused. mentioned that point yeah. because it, it's actually, you know, uh, this whole if you like, um, recent, uh, this issue recently has blown up on social networks because, like you said, the media is not picking up on it. So people are commentating across media, uh, you know, social media. And of course, some things sometimes get lost in translation, some things get miscommunicated. And you're absolutely right. You know, we're not talking about Islam and Muslims in Burma because there is a significant population of Muslims in Burma who are not Rohingya. So they might even be Burmese Buddhists who have reverted back to Islam. Hmm. So their opinion and the, the outcry against the Rohingya specifically, like I said, it's a country made up of many, many different ethnic um, groups. So it's not that you know, there, there is an intolerance towards a new ethnic group. Hmm. There's an intolerance towards certain ethnic groups. So with the Rohingyan, the, if you like, the allegation against them is that these are illegal Bangladeshi immigrants that have crossed the border, uh, border from Bangla uh, Bangladesh to try and find you know, wealth and, and prosperity. But, but this is exactly the point. What I heard is exactly mm -hmm. this. We are talking about immigration. We are talking about the perception that these people are coming mainly in history from Bangladesh. They are mm -hmm. coming inside and they are taking, you know, silently colonizing taking it. Away land exactly. Yeah. Yes, this is one thing. And still, there is something which is added here, which is the fact that they are Muslim mm -hmm. in a Buddhist majority yeah. society is worse and this is making their case uh, uh, more difficult. The fact that they are perceived as yeah. foreigners and then Muslims... And then Muslims yes. to compound the fact matter. So, so it means that still Islam yeah, and... A, their, their, the way, the, the, the yeah. way that we, like our organization particularly, the, you have to be very careful about how you word it. Yeah. We wouldn't say it's ethnic clashes, we wouldn't say it's religious clashes. It's actually an ethno-religious issue. Okay. okay, so it's both. But, but it's ethno thing. first, yeah. because it's against the ethnicity first. Mm -hmm. For example, the Rohingya are called a cross Burma. They're, you know, if you like, notoriously known as the Kala. And Kala in Burmese and across most of South Asia means black. Mm -hmm. And it's that kind of racism. Mm -hmm. and, and it's important to understand these are not recent immigrants. These, these, they have not immigrated from Bangladesh. You know, the Rohingya have been in Arakan, For generations the state, in, in, since in the century. 8th century. Yeah. That's 1,200 years. Yeah. And just to put into perspective, the Prophet was around 1,400 years mm. ago. Mm. So it's almost as far back as then. Mm. Mm. So it's not something that suddenly appeared over the last 30 or 40 years, which is what the Burmese government would like us to believe. The way that they, they, they speak of it, it's like, oh, these are recent uh, immigrants from Bangladesh. 
Whereas if you go and speak to Rohingya, Rohingya people, they don't even know what Bangladesh is. They're mm. generally an uneducated people because of the fact that they don't have access to education since mm. the 60s. So that, you know, there's been a crackdown on their own ability to expand and get that education. And so when you ask them, so can you speak Bangla with me? the language of Bangladesh, tell me about your ancestry, uh, ancestry in Bangladesh, they have no idea what you're talking about. So, so the point is, as you are mentioning, it's quite complex to understand what is happening and, and, and why. Still, now, if we look at the situation, and, and for this I have two questions. The first question is, people are now perceived as not really uh, uh, belonging to the society, as if they are foreigners. And, and the fact that there is this social uh, uh, discrimination mm -hmm. and their status is a second class citizenship. Yeah. How could we explain this beyond history? Because at the end of the day, they are uh, citizens in this society. This is the first question. How could we explain this perception up to now, after decades, mm -hmm. after centuries, that still they are not part of the society? We have to look at the state of Arakan, which is where they're from. Okay, the state of Arakan um, is actually, if you look at the actual state, it, you know, its, its actual borders were three quarters in Burma and one quarter in Bangladesh. Mm. But of course, after, you know, kind of partition and all of this kind of stuff, there was a, it, was, it was a mistake. It should have probably been, you know, created as a separate state or it should have been included in, t in, in total as one state, well, either in Burma or in Bangladesh, but it wasn't. It was split down the middle. Now, a lot of the Burmese Buddhist influence comes from the Arakan region. Mm. Okay, so the, uh, the the Rakhine, the people who are indigenous to the area, the Buddhists of the area, they're called the Rakhine people. Mm. They are very, um, how can I say? They're, they're very religious. They're very in line with their with their Buddhist beliefs, but they're also hugely nationalistic. Mm. Okay, and in the same because of the of of course the way that they see it is you know since a, a long time the Bangladeshis have been invading you know the Rohingya have been invading into the land and they've been they've been staying there but of course they refuse to acknowledge the fact that in actual fact if we go back in history we can see that many of the Rohingya served in the kingdom of Arakan its own state its mm. own government mm. and it, they actually fought for Arakan themselves because it's also their land mm -hmm. um, but there is an intolerance and that's so the there only is a, a collective know. psychology that there is there was in history there were yeah. clashes that's right uh, between I the, mean the, yeah. the Rakhine goes so far as to even say that the word Rohingya doesn't exist okay so it's a mm. complete denial of an existence of, a, of an ethnic group mm -hmm. so it the only way to explain it is intolerance and it's been building up over time and it hasn't helped that the Burmese government you know once it was taken over by the military you know was constantly pushing the lines of we must look after our one identity we must look after our one country our one nation pulling in the same direction of course the Rohingya don't speak Burmese mm. you know some of them do now of course because they've been there for so long but the Rohingya do not speak Burmese they don't speak Bangladesh either mm. they speak their own language mm. right so you know there's there's a, a, an unwillingness if if you like to what's the word to use um, to kind of uh, to naturalize into Burmese, yeah, yeah. Burmese life but this is this is taken uh, against them by saying you don't want to be yeah. Bur Burmese because because like I said I come back to the point of there is this agenda to push Burmese must be Buddhist yeah and the Rohingya are deeply spiritual and they will not move from Islam okay. so then it, the Islam issue comes into play at that so juncture. Th so this is this is exactly why yeah. it's important but I have a, a second question sure. now about uh, why is it that coming from all these people who are against the military, mm -hmm. against the, the dictatorship, that now there seems to be a consensus that the uh, uh, Rohingya mm -hmm. case mm -hmm. should not be supported because you are going to lose everything. And it, it comes from people at the grassroots level as far as symbols of you know, resistance. Yeah. I think you know, we, ha we must talk about the elephant in the room here, hmm. who is Aung San Suu Kyi. Hmm. Now, she was under house arrest for 20 years, you know, and the reason why is because she wanted to represent her ethnic minorities. Hmm. Because, like I said, Burma is made up of 135 ethnic groups. Hmm. So many were aggrieved by the military, you know, kind of okay. powers. Yeah, yeah. So they lent their support to Aung San Suu Kyi because hmm. they wanted their voices to be heard. The Rohingya too, hmm. you know, they, they campaigned they for her heavily. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, she actually won a Nobel Peace Prize. She was able to accept the prize recently, a couple of months ago in mm. London. And it was for the fact that she championed ethnic rights. So the fact that she is now not talking about the Rohingya issue is, of course, a huge blow. Yeah. It's a huge blow, um, undeniably. But we've got to look at the context of why that might be. So in 2010, this military government ended. 
And I say ended because the current president, President Tinshane, he was actually the prime minister, serving prime minister of that military government. Yeah, yeah. So nothing's really changed. Yeah. But with that change, if you like, of, you know, to a democracy, Suu Kyi was released from her house arrest. You know, earlier in, in this year, she was actually voted into Congress as well. Um, so, and, and it's seen by the West as, you know, a country which is embracing democracy. Some of the media laws have been relaxed a little bit. Um, you know, people have been, there was a general consensus for a long time that people were not allowed to uh, gather in, in groups larger than five after certain times. Hmm. All of those kind of things were relaxed. But of course... But could this uh, uh, justify her silence? Well, th I think the next part that I'm about to say will maybe yeah. justify it. There are elections coming up in 2015 yeah. and you briefly touched yeah. upon it yeah. before. Um, she's been winning. The fact that she's been allowed out of house arrest is a huge deal, yeah. and it's been by her oppressors. Hmm. Um, maybe there is some political shape shifting and agenda setting here. She doesn't want to upset her, 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 her you know, her, her, you know, her new buddies yes. in, in in power. Um, but I think that's also been very kind. I think the second way of looking at it is that she doesn't want to upset the majority of her voters, potential would-be voters. Mm. But could we uh, expect and hope that after the election she mm -hmm. could be more vocal about it? I think, like I said, I, if we're looking through really nice rose-tinted spectacles, perhaps. Yeah. But if you're looking through a reality uh, of it, then this is a huge issue. I mean, we're talking about, in this recent escapade, 130,000 people have been displaced. Yeah. Not only Rohingya, also Rakhine. Hmm. So okay. to not speak about it, I believe, you know, it's, it's, it's counterproductive to our country. Yes. Okay, one, one point. Why uh, what happened in July? Why did it happen and what happened exactly? How can we explain that this is coming now in such, with a, such a huge you know, consequences? Firstly, this isn't the first time. It's not, yeah. It's happened hmm. in 1978. It's happened in 1991, where more than 500,000 collectively Rohingya people crossed the border back to Bangladesh. Mm. Okay, they retreated there. I mean, we have to look at it like this. They, these people have been there for a long, long time. To want to move away from land that you own, land that you cultivate in, etc., etc., and to move away from that and have to go and live as a refugee in a third mm. country, which is foreign to you, where you can't speak the language, you're not particularly liked, you're probably treated worse than you are in Burma, your home country, it would have to be a really bad situation to do that. Mm. So in 1978 and 1991, there was a state-led, you know, aggression towards the Rohingya. Right mm. now, the spark, you know, the catalyst for this was there was a, an allegation of a rape um, of a Rakhine woman by three Rohingya yeah. men. Mm. After that, you know, a bus of 10 Muslim pilgrims was attacked. They weren't actually Rohingya. Mm. So this is again where the Islam side comes in. Yeah. Because of the fact that they were Muslim, they were seen as allies of the Rohingya. And they were slaughtered on the bus. Mm. Now, following that slaughter, um, the Rohingya wanted to hold, you know, uh, special prayers, um, you know, if you like, moments of, of thought for these 10 people at Friday prayers, the, you know, the following Friday. At that point, the, the you know, state government kicked in, the Burmese government kicked in, and said that we're going to announce an emergency state, a state of emergency. Uh, and, and the Muslims were not allowed to gather in groups more than five. Um, so the state PM. was involved in a of way... Of course, because then you had uh, uh, forces come in, the Nasaka, which are like se uh, secret police, and the Lunten, which is like paramil paramilitary services, and of course the police. So you had three major bodies um, in the area, and many, many cases. And you know, we have over 94 sources in, in Burma. And we've heard countless times that people's ho ho homes were being burnt down, Children were being slaughtered in front of their own eyes, you know, literally thrown into the sea. They were literally thrown, uh, daggers were thrown at their own children. Um, you know, men were being indiscriminately um, arrested, taken into unknown locations. Many are still missing. Some, sometimes disappearing. Completely. Com yeah. Still yeah. missing. And yeah. it's been yeah. seven, eight weeks, still missing. Yeah. We have no word. And literally forced away out of their homes. Now, when we look back now from this position, we can look back and think, this is actually a very well you know, kind of well thought out campaign because almost 95% of the Rohingya in that region, in Arakan, have now retreated into certain, we call them refugee camps, they're more like prisoner camps. Mm. Okay, they've been, re they've been made to retreat into these particular areas and large villages where they were staying have been destroyed almost in time for, um, for tourist season, which mm. is in a couple of months time. 
And, we, and we're even hearing reports of the fact that there are shops in, in busy market areas, where the Rohingya shops and labels have just been taken down, walls have been broken down. So there is a strategy behind the, the whole of thing. Of course yes. there's a strategy, yes. because we, we still have a state of emergency there as yes. well. So I have a question here. We can understand, and we talked about what is happening from within. So why, for example, some you know, figures and, and Aung San Suu Kyi not talking mm -hmm. about it because elections are coming. Now, could you explain why? You know, you are campaigning, you are doing the job at the grassroots mm -hmm. and helping and there are many Absolutely. you know, any, uh, NGOs doing yep. this. Why the international media are not talking about this? What, why is there silence with this? Because this is a case where it's just, you know, to be considered as one of the minorities which is the more discriminated in the world mm -hmm. and targeted and, and silence. Why? How yeah. would you explain that? I, I want to come back one step if it's okay and then I'm going to come and answer your question. Mm -hmm. You mentioned previously that the Rohingya teacher treated almost like second class citizens. Mm -hmm. They're actually stateless. That's the important thing to understand. Mm -hmm. Since 1982, a law was passed, a citizenship law was passed, which rendered them non-citizens. So they, okay, they don't even have a citizenship. They don't have a passport, they don't have birth certificates, they don't have death certificates. Is this the, the case for all? Because I heard something else. This is the case for all. For all, of them. For all. Okay. Unless they pretend that they're Burmese. Okay. And they have you know, documents which prove that they might be Burmese. Okay. You know, another so that's a very important point. So yeah. mm -hmm. the, if they don't, can't marry without state permission, they can't conceive more than two children without state permission, they don't have any land rights, they can't travel outside of the villages without state okay. permission. Mm -hmm. So we must understand the context. Yeah. Now, coming back to your question about, you know, why has the international media not picked up on this? Firstly, like I said, up until 2010, international media was pretty much banned from mm -hmm. entering into mm -hmm. Burma. Now, you know, they're still banned, to be honest with you. Mm. And because all when it's a state happening. of emergency, when it's a state of emergency, it's the sovereign uh, nation's right to either accept foreign, uh, foreign journalists into the region or not. Um, very rarely will a government reject that opportunity because they will want to show that they are not discriminating against any ethnicities, even if they are. Hmm. Even if they are, yeah. they'll still want journalists to come in and they might guide them to certain areas. Hmm. Whereas the Burmese government has outright denied any, 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 any access. And we must come back to the state of emergency issue, which is for, it's been about eight or nine weeks now since this issue has, been, has kicked off. And according to official reports, only 80 have passed away. Hmm. We're not talking about civil war. Hmm. There's hardly any fighting which has been reported by the Burmese government at the moment. Hmm. So that doesn't exist. Hmm. Why have the international media not gone in? They don't have access. We must provide that access. Okay. Thank you so much. I think that uh, it was quite interesting to listen to listen to you because what you are uh, giving us as information is, is really to understand that it's very complex. It's not only religious, but it is also religious. There are many different uh, uh, aspects that we have to keep in mind uh, in, with history, with perceptions, That's with right. understanding of the status of the people. And the religious factor is still remaining important here. And then the second thing which is uh, important is really to understand the, the level of discrimination mm -hmm. and, 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 and stigmatization added to what happened during uh, the last July and August Absolutely. with people being killed and disappearing, we don't know what is happening. And still yet, what we should hope is for the international media to cover the situation much more, at least to try yeah. uh, to let us know what is happening beyond the silence of the political uh, parties in, the, in the, the country. I think that these are important points. Uh, well, that's all we have time for. Please let us know your thoughts and views on any of the shows you have seen. And here is the way to contact us. Islam and Life welcomes your opinion. So please send us your suggestions as well as criticism on any of the shows you have seen or you would like to see. You can do all this by emailing us at islamandlife at presstv.co.uk. You can also be part of our online platform by joining our Facebook page, Islam and Life on Press TV, where you can share your thoughts with other Islam and Life fans, engage with debate and view past shows. Finally, I would like to thank my guest, Mabrur Ahmad. Thank you so much to help us to talk about the situation there. And I hope to see you next week, inshallah.